Ladies and gentlemen, our next and final speaker in the system track is Spike Morelli, who will be uh, doing a talk entitled, I'm Going Mad. Thank you very much. Is it working? Okay, all right. Sorry about it. Matt's up. I've gone mad already. Um, so, I'm going mad. It's, uh, I, I wanted to share what, uh, what I've gone through uh, in the past uh, six years from being a completely a system administrator to doing development, and then from being a full-time developer going back to do system administration and how that worked out for me. Um, how many developers are in the audience? Operations folk? Do we have any QA people? Some. <laughs> All right. So uh, I can say that this will work for you, but it has worked for me pretty well um, in, uh, in my various jobs. So I'm going mad. It's monitoring aided development. And one point that I start, I'd like to start with is that uh, we all code. And even when you start with your one-liner on a, on a bash shell, you are coding. You are effectively coding. And then maybe your one-liners become not enough, and you move to a bash script. And then you can go farther and start to do Perl, Python, Ruby, anything that you want. But you all code. Even if you are an admin, you're coding. If you are a QA person, testing automation is becoming bigger and bigger, and testing automation requires a lot of coding. And also we've seen a, a, a huge uptake with uh, configuration management lately. When you have a configuration management, either if you use uh, Puppet or Chef, uh, so a DSL, writing in Ruby, you're still coding. So we're still talking about code. But somehow, especially for people in operations where I, where I come from, you don't feel like a developer. You're not treated as a developer. Uh, and this is, this is hurtful, because this is one of the reasons the fact that operations and development use two completely different languages and don't recognize each other. It's part of the reason why, in organizations, we have these kind of problems. And this is a snippet of a map, uh, um, puppet manifest. And as you can see, it looks a lot like a piece of code. So, if we all code, we should try to talk to each other more than we do, and we should try to learn from each other more than we currently do. And it's, uh, it's weird as a, as a thing of not feeling as a developer, as a system, as a system person. Um, why don't I feel as a, as a developer? Why are my scripts not treated as if they were code? When, when, everybody, when people start um, developing and they wrote the first hello world, how is that anymore? It's, it kind of be about complexity because the low world is not more complex than your automation script. And nonetheless, you are kind of fall and feel as if you were a developer when you're writing your first hello world. People in operations are still the people that I know and met in my, in my career do not feel ever as developers. They feel as something completely different. Now, monitoring metrics is a lifetime love for me. I've, uh, since I started doing uh, um, my, my career as a system, uh, sysadmin, the fact that I had Nagios and then Nagios checked all my systems, for me it was awesome. The first day that someone showed me that Nagios, I was, wow, now something is checking things for me. Now it's, I can sleep much better than I used to. Uh, and then this, this huge uptake there is when from monitoring I discovered metrics. And metrics is, uh, is something that it kind of is, is it gets, it, talking of monitoring, talking of metrics, some people use one term uh, rather than the other. Uh, they all kind of belong to the same world, but effectively they have two completely different um, meanings. Metrics tell you how a system is doing. Monitoring tells you much more like, is the system okay? Is the system broken? And if you, if you think about medicine, I, I, uh, if you think about the, the metaphor of a doctor, uh, doctors for our, in, in our Western culture, they, they come in when you get sick. So when you get sick, you go and see the doctor, and the doctor try to backtrack what happened, how you were doing in, in the last uh, 
10 months and figure out what might have gone wrong. And when I went to China and I, and I had uh, kind of a, I, I got to see how all Chinese doctors used to, used to work. A Chinese doctor always follows you. It follows you when you are okay. And you pay them to keep you healthy. And when you get sick, that's when you don't pay them because they failed. And in this way, metrics to me are, are a much better way of understanding and looking at a system because you kind of follow the system rather than just getting to know when something is broken or something works. And I had, um, I spent some time in, uh, in data warehousing. And uh, in data warehousing I met this guy that was a, a pure data geek at its best. It has these huge piles of data heaps and heaps of data, and he could pull out incredible things out of these heaps of data. And that's where I got my, my love for metric, metrics, comes from, um, comes from this experience. And this guy had a, um, had a great message, and one day he told me, there is no such thing as too much data, only data you don't know how to make sense of. And this is very important because obviously there, there is a cost in having all this data and having all these metrics, there is a uh, data analytics uh, dev room which was really interesting and they, they talk a lot about how you do data mining and what you can get out of, uh, of that data and certainly it isn't a simple task. But that task has huge payoffs. And so sometimes you come across people that say, well, why would I want to keep certain metrics? Why would I want to, you know, I just keep CPU or I just keep memory, there's few things. What's the point of keeping more of them? What's the point of keeping them for longer? You know, they're going to take all this space and then there's noise. Uh, how am I going to find all the good informations that are hidden in all this data? Um, so, why the, but while there is a cost, then that point obviously is, is partially true. There is a cost to it, but it's important to recognize the benefits. And so, Certainly, you have to mind information overflow. There, there are no free lunches. You cannot expect that by starting collecting data instantly, you'll be able to figure out uh, everything about your systems that you didn't know before. Uh, and there certainly is uh, a risk that you will be misled by all those metrics. So, I didn't. I didn't test my code. As a system guy, when I started, I did no testing whatsoever. Obviously, I would run, uh, and when I'm saying testing, I'm kind of talking about unit testing to begin with. But mostly, I would run my scripts and test them maybe on, at that time, that barely were VMs, uh, maybe some Zen, beginning of Zen. Um, and you would do some of that, and then you would have a box in the office to run some of this stuff on. And that was mildly all right. But you know unit testing nothing because that's not how we roll in, uh, in, in hops, apparently. And then I, I met, so I changed company, I changed job, and I, I went to this other company where there were uh, better developers. And not just because there were better developers, and better maybe is, uh, is a, uh, I'm abusing the term, uh, but they were more friendly toward operations. And so they really believed in testing and they wanted to talk about it. And so they were doing like talks during lunch and various things to which we ended up going as, as an operations department and, and inspired me. I got inspired by how they were approaching software development, how much value they were putting on testing and how much they were getting out of this testing. They had metrics to prove that testing for them worked really well. They produced better softwares, fewer bugs, they had less problems in production. And so I started to kind of wanted to do this testing, but then I still couldn't because systems don't do testing at all. But then I, I moved on as I started my own business and I, and I wanted to actually make something. And I guess it's the same, it's happening the same even with free software projects. All the new free software projects that are coming out these days, they all have tests and they actually go on how much coverage we'll, we'll get to it. They get on the tests. So I started to do something, and the amazing thing is that as I started to do testing, I realized that actually, in a way, as a system person, I was doing testing already. 
And when, we, when I started to do TDD, I realized that I used to do TDD with Nagios because you would bring up a service in Nagios, a service check in Nagios, and then you would bring up a Nagios monitoring system, and then you, I, you would bring up the system and you would see the check pass, which is what people do in test-driven development. They write the test first, they see the test failing, then they write the code, they satisfy the test, and they see the test pass. And that gives them uh, a certain amount of certainty that that code is correct. And test-driven development is, um, is really interesting for, for many other reasons. One is security. I realize that sometimes developers don't care too much about security, depending on what they're doing, and these, uh, there are always fights between operations and, uh, and development because developers maybe don't care as much as operations would like them to do about security. TDD is great for security because you can write tests with in mind uh, like user input. So if you have a, a function that validates email, you can write a test that checks for escape characters in your email. So TDD is a great way to do testing. And so when I start applying testing, I also start to record the success rate of my test, how was that in testing, and I had this kind of thing coming up. This is more uh, the, the, the beginning of a project. And this graph tells a story that you would not be able to see if you just looked at some numbers at any given time. And what this graph is telling me, is telling me that I didn't do as much testing in the beginning where I was introducing unit testing. And then I got to tag 01 where I wanted to kind of do a release. And I actually matched and all my tests passed. And then I diverged again. I was adding tests, but some of them were failing. I wasn't really caring. And then again, another release, and I matched it again. And now there is an interesting thing happening up there. I'm not diverging anymore. And I'm not diverging anymore because I've introduced TDD. And so I'm writing the test before writing my code, and I'm not forgetting. When I, when I, you can set up in, in Git, GitHub, Mercury, or whatever you use, you can set up your hooks to, to run your tests, your unit tests, when you do a commit and reject a commit if the tests don't pass. Now, as you get your tests and you think, OK, well, I'm adding this test, I'm doing well, but then you have the question of how much does test cover of my of my code base, because it's, it's useless if you're adding a lot of tests for just one small portion of your code. And then you can start to measure this as well and graph it. And you can get something like this. And something like this, at a first glance, again, it says something. And you can see that you didn't have coverage. You've gone up in the beginning, and then you kind of got up to the 80, and then you've got down from 80. So you've lost coverage, probably, because you had the code and you added some tests but the stats weren't covering your code. And then you go up to a top and you, where you're reaching 100% coverage. And it's interesting that you've reached 100% coverage with tag 2 but you've added almost no tests, just a few tests. So that is an interesting thing. And we'll come back to it in, in a minute. And then you start thinking, well, I've got this coverage, I've got this test. Are there any other interesting metrics? How big is my code base? And you could say lines of code. Well, lines of code is a really bad metric because how big is your actual code is not really what you're interested in, but it's a good starting point. So you kind of go, thanks, but no thanks. If you start to graph it, nonetheless, it says something interesting again because, as you can see, you've got a number of tests and your coverage and then your lines of code going up. And now, do you remember from the, from the previous slide that I had achieved 100% coverage on tag 2 even though I didn't add many tests. Look what happened to the lines of code. It went down. Why it went down? Because I refactored. So in this graph, having these metrics recorded and having them graphed tells me something that I would not necessarily catch if I didn't have something like this. So at this point, I know, and if you, if you think about, you know, over the span of a year, you could pinpoint every time you refactor, every time you change something uh, big in your code. But obviously, as you said, Linux code is not a good metric. What you're really interested in is complexity, which is your enemy. You don't want complex code because you're more likely to induce bugs. The same way that you don't want complex systems, 
because they're more prone to failure. But how do you measure uh, complexity? And the things that I started thinking with is um, something, uh, some ideas that I got from, uh, from Spam Assassin and Spam Man. Uh, simple scoring. So you begin to think, you know, how do I assess complexity and what metrics can I use to address complexity? And so one thing that you can start to do is call graphs. Call graphs, so you can use, there are many, many libraries that will scan your code and it will tell you a call graph, so which function is calling which function and it will build a tree. And so by there you can see the amount of nesting. Now, if you have a lot of nesting where you get functions, then maybe you get like a four, five, I've seen six, ten layers of nesting. That is really bad. That counts. That is a metric that you can use to score your code as a complex code. Number and size of functions. There are people that will limit, that will impose arbitrary limits on the length of your functions because they say long functions are hard to read and again, it's easier to introduce bugs. So you can use that as a metric to judge the complexity of your code. The other thing is code closure. Now, code closure is uh, something I, I came across recently with Michael Feathers. He made a post on his blog. And uh, he was saying, if your code is good code, you tend to not change the same files many times. You tend to add new files or add classes. If you think in terms of uh, object-oriented uh, programming, and so the idea that you extend your classes, you don't necessarily will touch classes that you've written before. And so he graphed his, uh, his commits on GitHub. And you could see that a lot of the files were never touched again. It were introducing new files or adding functions. And then it had a couple of areas where it had like hundreds of changes. And so it targeted those places for refactoring. So it's again a metric that helps you write in better code, which then in turn it works better in production and keeps your operation happier. And again, then you have complexity of the build system. If you have a, build in, uh, a complex application, you generally end up with a complex build system. So the complexity of a build system is a good indicator and can be used for scoring to judge the complexity of your code. And again, here a graph of, of those things, and you can see that complexity, and this line is reassuring because it tells me that despite several changes, my code complexity has not gone up. And also, it's important to do it with style. Style can also be a source of metrics. How good is your code? So for example, you can use stuff like Lintian, which is a, a, it's a checker that will run through your code and have a lot of, uh, tell you a lot of things about your code if you're naming the way you're naming your variable makes sense, uh, if you, uh, the length of your lines, all sorts of things that you can pick up. And there are specific ones like PEP8, I use a lot of Python, so I'm using PEP8. Uh, and then reward beautiful code. This is another thing that uh, I found really to be really important. And this works, uh, works both for operations and for development. Uh, especially for operations, this is really important. And this is a thing that I picked up in development. Developers tend to reward beautiful code. They tend to reward good code. So they put value on doing it right. Operations, if you're doing, if, if operations does it right, nobody notices. Culturally, that is how it's expected, and that is, all, is also harmful, because nobody is supposed to notice that, and nobody get, gives value to what operations has done directly. And this creates a conflict between operations and, uh, and development, because operations go on, well, they get all the credit. We don't get any credit. And so you create this, uh, this animosity. Now, the thing with metrics is uh, um, people complain, the biggest complaint that I've heard when I talked about metrics is that as soon as you introduce a metric, people will start gaming it. And all the companies that they've tried to, to introduce met metrics, for example, to judge developers, uh, how good they were doing, how good the, the stuff was, uh, have more or less, to a certain extent, failed because uh, developers would start gaming those metrics just to get a raise at the end of the year or something. So there are problems with metric. Again, there are no free lunches. It's not just the cost of analyzing. The cost of rising, there is a mindset 
that has to be changed in order to make good use of metrics, but they are extremely powerful. And then, of course, all the stuff that I was doing, and I was doing it manually, then you shouldn't be doing it manually, really. And so I started to use a CI, and I, I stopped exporting data when I was doing commits, or looking at my commits and scanning my code, and I started to use Adson, then it's been renamed to Jenkins, Billbot is great as well, but anything that is continuous integration, it is really useful. And continuous integration is also being picked up by, by operations, uh, for, uh, for system scripts, there are people that use continuous integration to run through the, the Puppet or Chef Manifest again. Uh, all these configuration management stuff has changed a lot, the stuff in operations. Um, but in doing this, I, I kind of forgot where I was coming from because I kind of got really excited about the metrics and about the development. And where I came from is this. And this is really bad. And if you haven't been on call, uh, you probably don't realize what it is to be on call. When I wasn't on call in my first year of system administration, I didn't really know what I was talking about. The first time that I went on call, it, it really shook me. And when I had this, uh, I, I had a specific ringtone on the phone that the company gave me, and we couldn't change the ringtone. After I left the company, when I was in a public place and someone would have the same ringtone, I would twitch. So you kind of have these things that, you know, it really gets into your life. It's really difficult to, to, to kind of, it, being on call really sucks big time. And so you want to avoid it. And one thing that you can do to avoid it, and one way, one path that has worked for me, is to introduce metrics because how is greater than if. And it is never too early to start monitoring your application's behavior. And this is key. This is where operations and development can start to collaborate much more. Operations can bring to development, and this is happening to a certain extent in, uh, in new development environments. Put monitor in those development environments. Add monitoring, track CPU usage, memory usage, and add those metrics. And those metrics can help developers because, again, we do TDD to catch, for example, TDD is good for refactoring because you know that if you have your tests, and you refactor, and you break something, you will know. Now, how about using metrics for CPU usage or memory usage to figure out that when you refactored, you actually introduce a loop in your code or a memory leak? Wouldn't that be useful? Wouldn't it be useful to figure out that you've introduced a memory leak before it hits production, before you finish the sprint if you're doing Agile or whatever you're doing and you get two months later, a month later to run, maybe you're still testing and you're still doing load testing and you figure it out before production, but it happens later. And you have to go back and kind of figure it out, how it went wrong, where it went wrong. So monitoring and having metrics from day one can be really, really helpful. And it has helped me directly in, in some of the code that I've written because I'm still not a great developer and I made a lot of mistakes. And testing has saved my life in many cases, and having metrics has saved me in many, many cases. Another thing that can be done is to write code that is monitoring friendly. This is another thing that developers can help, can kind of come together, a point of contact between development and operations in the, in the sort of DevOps kind of a, a cultural change. And here, guys, it's a small flask cap, and as you can see, I've got a slash mon slash status a slash mon slash self-test, and a slash mon slash metrics. So if you have stuff like that, I can point my Nagios, my monitoring system, to those kind of things, and I can get very easily, very simply, a status of an application, or the performances, for example, if it's a web app, you could store the last 100 return code in a, in a man cache. And this is happening a good deal in, um, in system tools, like if you think of man cache, for example, man cache has a, you can tell it to the port and you can run a status command and you get out a list of, all, of the current status of man cache, which is really useful to judge uh, how your caches are doing. Um, and the bottom line is that ops is changing, operations is changing. Configuration management has made a huge difference in how operations has been moving in the last couple of years, three years. And we're closing in to something that looks much more what developers are used to. And this is really important because, again, in this 
conflict between operations and development that many organizations have, one of the big problems is the language that both parties are speaking. And the fact that both parties can speak code is greatly helping to reduce that divide. Configuration management also has given birth to this infrastructure as code sort of thing, which basically means that since now my, how my systems are set up is close to writing a piece of code, now my infrastructure really can be represented with code, which can help in, uh, in this process. And then you have behavior-driven development, which is something fairly new, but it's something that developers love. There are, there are a lot of developers that really like to do behavior driven development and they use either Cucumber or Robot Framework. Those are uh, applications that will allow you to write in, uh, in uh, native languages, like in plain English or whatever is your language, in natural language. You write your test and you say something like, when I connect to such and such page, I expect such and such output. And those when and expect are keywords that tools like Cucumber, Robot Framework, or Lattice, if you do Python, will know how to interpret and convert into a test. So now you have something that developers are really happy with. They love to do BDD. And now operations can use it. There is a plugin called Nagios Cucumber that allows you to run um, tests written in natural language with Nagios to monitor your application. So now there is no longer this kind of a, developers write their own tests and then they pass it to operation, which have to rewrite the tests into something else to fit whatever monitoring infrastructure they're using. The two groups can use the same language and the same tools. And then continuous integration, as I was saying, it's already happening in ops. And having these things in common can greatly help with the dialogue. And so you can help, but how, how do you help? If you are an op, realize and accept that you code. Don't think that because you are in operations, the fact that you're in operations justifies no testing, no using unit testing, no using the sort of paradigms that developers are using. Learn from your developers. Understand how they do it, why they do it, what they do, and adopt those kind of techniques. There's lots of good stuff. And advertise your achievements. I, I touched on these earlier. Developers are generally um, identifies as the ones that produce the features, produce the what is sold to customers. So that is what is visible. Operations are never visible. And so start to advertise your achievements. Start to talk about it. And engage your developers. In my experience, when I start to, uh, to actually go to developers and ask, well, how could I test my, my, my scripts? They were more than happy to talk to me. So really, it's not that they don't care, it's just that they're speaking a different language and there is a hurdle in, uh, in getting over that, that diversity. So if you ask for things that they recognize as familiar, they would be more than happy to help you. If you're a developer, treat ops as developer. Understand that they're writing code and recognize that. Share the knowledge. How are you doing? Again, do the opposite of what ops are supposed to do in terms of getting in contact. Code applications that are easier to monitor, like we went through, and learn from operations, like type, tap into the, the knowledge about metrics and monitoring, because it can be really useful. And the most important metric, this is something that I stole from, uh, from Patrick's talks. Uh, Patrick Dubois gave a talk about uh, DevOps in, in London last week. It was a great talk, and it was all about culture, no tools. And his talk was about trust. And trust is the most important metric. Trust is the most important metric because if you're trying to get these two groups together to talk to each other, there is a, there is a gain to be made there. Because if you, if you have like 10 people, and each one of those people can, in theory, produce 10 of whatever, unit of work, and then one of those people doesn't trust uh, one of the developer doesn't trust one of the ops people, then they will hold their work waiting for the ops of the group that they will like, or maybe they will install their applications on their own. They become a bottleneck, so your production goes down because you're not trusting each other. And to close, so don't let uncertainty drive you insane. Go mad. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
Yes. Questions? No? Thank you. No? One? What? Oh, there you go. Well, uh, okay. Uh, so there's a little part of your presentation I didn't catch because uh, what is TDD? <laughs> what, I what is the theme? TDD. Oh, TDD, sorry. Test driven development is the fact that you develop your tests before you develop your code. So rather than, than writing your code and then you go on and say, well, what really should this code look like, how it should behave, and then writing a test, you write your test first, and then you write the code to make that test pass. That is much more likely to guarantee that you will have all your tests in place, that all your tests will cover all your code. Does that make sense? Hi. Uh, could you speak to the automation of tests in a deployment kind of scenario? Uh, so, the automation in tests and deployment, sure. Um, with, I've, the thing that most people I've seen doing and I've done myself uh, uh, is done with virtual machines. So, uh, what you end up doing is uh, generally try to spin up and create with virtual machines uh, environments from scratch, uh, which is what sort of QA is used to. And then you deploy your code. So, Adson can, do, can deploy your code to, to any machine that you want, or so could BuildBot. Uh, so the idea is that you use something like, uh, um, even Adson, for example, can spin up an instance if you want, so you can tell it to create an instance with Xen, KVM, or in the cloud if you want, deploy your code to it, and then run a script. And that script can run all your tests and give you all the things. If you're doing other things like uh, um, uh, with, continuous, uh, with continuous integration, you could run metrics on the same box, the Adson or whatever is the continuous integration that you use runs on, uh, that is perfectly fine. It is not that good to do integration testing. It works well like to get metrics from unit tests, uh, not so well for integration testing. From integration testing, really, you would want either develop the environments that are on demand or environments that you can at least clean out between runs because you don't want to reuse the same environment twice. Uh, does that clear the question? Good. Yeah, I think we're good. What? Oh. Hello. My question might sound a bit cynical, but do you think it's really possible for developers and operations to trust each other? You uh, said you spoke to some uh, developers when we were in operations, and they were really interested in helping you uh, making their applications more testable and everything. But uh, my experience is exactly the opposite. I'm what, in operations, and most developers don't want to talk to operations, want to just code and do nothing else. And they have their own idea how it should work, which is really, and it's really hard to get to them and to explain them how the real life works. Well, so the thing is that I'm not, I'm not saying that developers should behave and take on responsibilities of operation. I totally appreciate that as a developer, I don't want to know. In fact, when I start coding, I'm bothered by the fact that I have to install something or take care of something because it breaks. I wouldn't want to do that. So I appreciate that. But I'm, what I'm saying is that um, in terms of um, how you handle certain problems, that kind of thing can happen transparently. So think, for example, continuous integration. It's a good, it's a good thing where um, both operations and development contribute to that system. And then without having like, so, um, say, as an operation, I contribute to the fact that when your continuous uh, integration spins up an instance on Xen or KVM, it installs monitoring 
It installs monitoring that monitors everything that's happening on that box. As a developer, then, I deploy my application on, uh, on that box, or I have my application end up on the box, and I don't have to know that those metrics have been collected and how. All I care is that I get that feedback. So I don't require the developer to be involved with creating that environment. I'm saying that developer has, a, has an advantage if he takes those metrics, he looks at those metrics and takes what operation can give him. So th there is a collaboration that is possible without requiring either party to actually learn the inner details of how the other, the other uh, side is working. Uh, you shouldn't need to, to know the inner details of how to set up Nagios. That is irrelevant. But if you think like, for example, in uh, with beha behavioral driven development and writing a test in natural, in natural language, that is a good example. The developer doesn't have to learn anything about how Nagios work. He writes his test with Cucumber, with Robot Framework, and then he passes the test to operation. So there, operations and development they, they give to each other, they gain from each other without actually having to learn anything in terms of uh, the underlying details. Does that make sense? No, go, go ahead. Why doesn't it, does it make sense? Because in the end, uh, from what I've seen, uh, developers live in a different world. Can you, can you speak a bit louder, please? <clears throat> Sorry. So from what I've seen, developers live in a different world and they... Uh, Sure, but is that good? No. Right, okay. So if we agree that it's not good, what is the simplest thing that you can do uh, to try and, and fix that? And in my, for, from my experience, the simplest thing that you can do, it's kind of to congregate around testing and congregate around common tools. Because the, the fact that you're using completely different terminology and things it contributes to the fact that, as a developer, I don't want to know about all that stuff. So your idea is that uh, the two worlds of developers and ops uh, can come around exactly around testing and use that as an intermediate yeah. language? Yeah, you, uh -huh. use, you, use, you use testing as, a, as an excuse, as a, as a common language to talk about what has to eventually happen in production. Is it better now? Cool. Uh, I think there's one that... Hi. Uh, just a practical question, when you talk about uh, the scripts that you write and the testing that you apply over them and all of that, uh, what's the, which are the languages that you use, uh, which are the uh, tools that you use to unit test those uh, scripts or those well pieces of code or whatever you want to call them? Uh, just uh, that. Sorry, I, I, catch, I didn't catch the beginning of your question. When I spoke about what? Uh, when you when you talk about uh, the the code that you oh, write, the, the code graph. Yeah, the code that you write. So, in which language do you write that code? Uh, what which kind of things uh, does that uh, code uh, do, and what uh, what problems that does it address, and how you test it? So, which uh, which uh, framework or whatever do you use to unit test uh, mm -hmm. that, and to even to record those those unit tests, the results. Sure. So uh, I develop mostly in Python. So the tools and the things that I use are, are, are pretty much all around Python and a bit of Ruby these days, but still. So for the call graph and that kind of thing, I use uh, PyCallGraph, uh, which works really well in outputs in, uh, in dot format. So you can even graph it with graph bits. Um, uh, that, works, uh, that works really well. I mentioned PEP8 to do the and Lintian. Uh, to do the style checker on my code. And uh, I used to use BuildBot for the, the continuous integration. Um, I ran in problems configuring BuildBot, and at that time I couldn't really be bothered with figuring them out. And so I tried Atson, and Atson seems to do all it in, a, in an easy way. So I switched to that. 
Um, the other thing that I use, I, uh, I use a um, KVM on my box uh, to uh, uh, this Python libvert to drive. Uh, libvert is an abstraction on top of KVM, well, on top of every possible known virtualization system uh, except proprietary ones. Um, so you can, from Python, you can drive, for example, uh, creating a new virtual machine and then deploying, getting AdSense to deploy code to it and then run all your checks in there. For um, the behavioral driven development, I use Lactus, which is a, is a Python uh, clone of uh, Cucumber. Robo framework is also very interesting and it's probably more known than Lactus on sort of a the big level, it, can, it is more powerful, but for, uh, for simpler stuff, uh, I would say Lactus is much more approachable. So I would recommend that, at least to start with. Um, what else is that? To store metrics, I've done uh, a few, I've, I use a few different things. I tried to use SQLite because I didn't need anything big and it was mostly just me. So I used SQLite to store all the metrics in, uh, in the beginning. Uh, and then for other metrics and system metrics, I used to use um, RD tool, uh, and then I moved uh, a lot of stuff to Graphite, just because it's simpler. The problem with, um, with, with RDD tool is that it expects uh, things to be in, this, in the exact time series, and if you miss a certain, a certain time slots, it will give you troubles. Graphite is more tolerant in sending sporadic events, which is what kind of you end up doing when, uh, when you just send metrics, when you do commits and similar things. Um, I think that's, uh, that's about it. That's pretty much all the tools uh, that I'm using. Oh, and for unit testing, I use uh, the, the built-in unit test framework. So, uh, uh, yeah, the, the unit test that, that comes with, uh, with the standard lib. Uh, PyTest is, uh, is cool as well. They, they have a bunch, of, uh, uh, a bunch of advantages. The other thing you might want to look at is talks. T or X, uh, which allows you to, uh, to set up different environments with even different versions of Python. So you can run, like concurrently, you can test on 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, and 2.7, and 3, all of them, and test all your code. And that is also interesting because you can collect metrics. It's another case where metrics can be very useful. You can collect metrics and see how your code performs on different versions of Python. So that can be interesting because you might say, well, I focus on my development on 2.6 because I get better performances. Um, yeah, that's all. Uh, I think we're done. Done. Yes. Done. There are still, there yeah. still some questions. No. Are there still some more questions? Otherwise, I would say thank you. Uh, one there's, there. uh, there's one more. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, I have to, to implement application monitoring in a uh, quite heavy corporate environment, and I'm, I'm facing the, the opposition of, uh, I would say, or the reluctance of the operations people uh, to, to send so much event, so much uh, data into their, their system. Uh -huh. uh, do you have any comment on that? Um, so obviously, if you have a, a lot of data, it's problematic. It can be, it can be a pain. All this stuff, uh, I've been doing it mostly for myself, so I had uh, small necessity. I've used to deal in the back uh, uh, a couple of jobs ago with, uh, with a lot of data and we had like huge MySQL clusters or HDFS also have used that it works pretty well. There is a, there is a project called uh, Open, uh, Open HDMS uh, which has been launched by um, uh, the, uh, what's this called? Um, not Twitter people, uh, Dig, uh, not Dig, uh, one of these big companies, now I'm forgetting the name, which is basically RRD, so you had, you get uh, kind of the, the sort of thing that round robin databases do, and an RDD tool does in terms of, you know, giving you uh, graphs and all of that and storing metrics, but on HDFS, so that's quite interesting. It gives you a backend as a file storage that scales really well, 
and at the same time you get you still have an interface um, that it's uh, that you would manage like you would not kind of normally interface the RRD. Um, the other interesting things that you can do if you want to use uh, sort of RRD based tools uh, now RRD supports uh, RRD cache D. RRD cache D uh, caches your reads and writes and you can chain them so you can have different boxes that store different slices you sort of partition your data and then you have sort of a you ask all the RRD cache D and you cache that and uh, uh, so you have like one master node in chain to all the others and that kind of makes you uh, makes scaling RRD uh, easier and, and fairly possible, fairly feasible. Um, otherwise, uh, um, it depends, it really depends also on what kind of data. I mean, for some things you could think of using, for stuff like this, probably a key value store would work really well because at the end, at the end really, metrics, we're really talking about a label and a value and a, and a point in time. You know, you have three variables. You just have, you know, the, the point in time. So using something like uh, Redis works really well. Uh, Redis and Cassandra and Mongo, uh, depending on what you're doing for, for metrics, I would probably use Redis uh, over Mongo. And the thing with Cassandra, it works really nicely, but it comes with a uh, kind of a heavy luggage because you have to get all the thrift uh, and other things coming out of Facebook, which are really nice, but then you have to maintain them. And so Redis in that sense is a bit more lightweight. Anything else? No? Thank, Thank you, you very much, much then.